repository and the ways of its management. The project has a particular uh, vision, not only for collecting memories and the data related to Bengal partition. It is actually more generally more focused on the whereabouts of after the partition. Like we are uh, dealing with what economic, social, sociological, so different aspect maybe you are taking it up, not only focusing the memory. So more importantly, we are in, uh, taking interviews from the uh, lower middle class people who have lost everything, their home, wealth, land, and many more due to this havoc migration and uh, their uh, changing of places. So the first part of, the, uh, of my presentation deals with the idea of Bengal partition repository and how it has started. So what is actually the idea of uh, Bengal Partition Repository? Bengal Partition Repository is a project based on digital archive focusing on the partition of Bengal. It has been steadily shaping up under the initiative of the Center for Language, Translation and Cultural Studies, which is an initiative, initiation of the School of Humanities, Netaji Shoghan's Open University. So what happened during this project? A series of research activities focused on partition literature, international seminar, lectures, workshop, and collaborative research project organized by School of Humanities uh, in uh, collaborating with different universities. For example, we have a collaboration with, now we have a collaboration with uh, Bangladesh Open University. And before that, we have a collaboration with, like collaboration in the sense of MAU with uh, Khulna University English discipline. So this ways through which we are conducting interviews in Bangladesh because without uh, you know uh, collaboration it's very difficult to uh, work in Bangladesh so for that reason we are uh, collaborating with different university universities and different zones because there are people like uh, there are zones like uh, uh, Khulna or maybe Khulna Bangladesh or maybe uh, Dhaka or Moment Singh these are the areas where we can explore more uh, in terms of uh, collecting interviews and uh, we are not uh, so much focused on Assam, uh, India, maybe later on, maybe this February or March, uh, we have a plan as per our information from our director that maybe we'll conduct more interviews uh, from uh, Assam, especially Guwahati and these regions, because these are the border regions. So border regions are mostly important for conducting interviews because there are people who are associated with this uh, migration and that is actually the uh, reason of conducting more uh, conducting more interviews on the border specific region but we have done extensively on the border specific regions like uh, in uh, in west bengal border specific region like uh, koch bihar or uttar dinajpur or murshidabad nodia these are the districts maybe we have focused more so we have focused less on Kolkata around areas, but our focus is more on district level uh, and the part of uh, border specific region. So what is there in the archive? The archive maintains uh, a collection of digital copies of various post partition materials, such as personal memoirs, correspondences, reminiscences, books, diaries, and like. And keep in mind that we are not keeping anything like, for example, for letters, for, uh, for uh, uh, for letters or maybe for other material, we are not keeping it in a, any kind of physical copies. We are keeping it everything uh, like a digital material. And you can say that it's a kind of the production of this digital born material. Uh, okay, so we are not keeping it any kind of physical copies in our center or in our archive. So everything is digitized and we are not taking from uh, the collectors also, not any kind of physical copies, but you can get it all it in digital copies. So the project aims is tackling actually collecting oral history and the personal narrative similar other than narratives lying outside the official archives. And this is also the specific reason that we are not uh, making more focus on the official archives. Like what is not there in the archive, official archives, that is actually uh, the main motto of this archive. So what is not in the archive, like official archive, that is actually the main motto of this archive to find out something related to uh, which is not available, which is not uh, reached. That is our more, uh, motto of this BPR project. So naturally what received here is the utmost emphasis on the non-available material in the archive. 
So here the point comes beyond archival and putting more emphasis on non-archival material. And thereby we are trying to find out the gaps in the archive. So this is also the issue that always comes to our mind. Those who are archivists and those who are dealing with archival material, they know there are always a gap uh, in the archive. So to find out the gap is actually uh, our uh, one of the motto of this Bengal partition repository. So this unique project simultaneously taps into the living past and unfolding the presence of the people living on both sides of India-Bangladesh border. A lot of work has been done on border specific areas that I have said already. And our research associated have identified the border specific regions and worked in detail. Even you could see the detail uh, work uh, in our repository website. I'll let you know the website link later on. Uh, uh, and also I'll send you the link at the part of my presentation. So the characteristic feature of the project is in bi bilingual nature. So it's not about that we are dealing with it, everything in English, but uh, both Bengali and English have been used to document, to read, write it down and uh, <clears throat> to for metadata and everything. So <clears throat> it's not only uh, one language, has been, it's a bilingual in nature. So the project is structured, if you see, if you... <clears throat> So if you see the project website, like our repository website, we'll see that there are different categories. For example, we have a category called memory. So in memory, you have like audio, video, catalog, personal letters, memento, and photographs. And in case of, uh, there's another section called literature, you'll find the book reviews, uh, including fiction and nonfiction, short story, poetry, essays, and articles, pamphlets, and periodicals. And, and there is another, the, the third category is the history, where you'll find the events, map, academic papers, reading list, uh, for example, fiction, nonfiction links. And there is important one link that the fourth link is a full book PDF. There are some books which, has, which are not available in the market. That book is totally, you can get it in our website. Like those the books that, was, that, were, that were published in different region and different uh, zones specific to different district level. So this is not actually the mainstream uh, literature that you'll get it here. It's a, something that is not available in the mainstream literature. That is actually uh, the section uh, dealing with. And that the fifth section is on borders. So borders means we have divided the borders as per the geographical location, and you'll get the detail of the borders and how uh, report also uh, accumulated there. And, and then there is another section like lecture videos where all the partition lecture, we have uh, conducting partition lecture by different uh, uh, exponent members of the people who are already worked on partition or maybe uh, the writer uh, on creative writer, they are giving lecture on partition lecture series. So we'll get all the lectures in uh, videos there in, in the lecture video section. And there is one section like writer's windows. So in writer windows are uh, containing uh, basically those who are the writers on partition, especially I'm talking about Bengal partition. Uh, these writers section are there, we'll get the idea of who are the writers and what are the writings are there. And in that other section, like uh, there is a project researcher and collaborative project and different stages of life, uh, of this project. So the project has, you know, it's not initiated by only single day. It has uh, a different uh, distinct stages. That the first was, stages was funded by EGC and a small group of people under the guidance of Professor Monon Kumar Mondor, who is the principal investigator, collected oral narratives mainly through audio recordings. So the second phrase is called mapping partition memory, amnesia and literature in middle and southern Bengal and Indo-Bangladesh perspective. So this is the result of collaboration between CLTCS, that is the name of our center, and the English discipline of Khulna University, Bangladesh. So why this, as I said in the beginning, because of the collaboration, there are different stages of this project and maybe the different names of the project. So maybe I'll not be uh, dealing with more because I have less time. I have to finish in 25 minutes. So I'll not be talking more about the different stages, but you could see in naturally that these stages have different names and different collaboration. 
and uh, ultimate result of of all this collaboration and of all these stages are uh, the result ultimate result is bengal partition repository and maybe there are different stages and uh, <clears throat> and a third stage is we have uh, we have a seminar that i have said it in the beginning and we have a lot of publication also and uh, after the, before the publication we have uh, this partition lecture series that i have said it and there are different people like very famous and renowned person like professor pavitra sarkar uh, vice chancellor of pavitra harit university professor abdullah mamun of the department of english rajsa university and there are other people like the sukhina dr sukhina cha they are also uh, participated in in the partition lecture series and there are publication detail like we have a first publication in 2017 uh, by uh, professor monon kumar uh, mondol uh, like partition sahitya uh, it's called and it was published by uh, gangchil in 2017 and then there is a partition literature and open praxis publication in the second one by sridip dr sridip mukherjee associate professor of english netaji shubhas open university and professor monon kumar mondol so we have third publication also uh, result of this project is the revisiting partition and bangladesh liberation war contemporary perspective edited by sir mr chatterjee associate dr sir mr chatterjee associate professor of english alia university and professor himadri lahiri professor of english netaji shubhas open university so these are actually the outcome of this project as a volume of books so uh, there may be different question that comes to our mind is the existence of uh, a repository how a, a repository can exist for a longer period of time uh, because there is a question that comes to our mind can uh, bengal uh, can uh, repository or archive uh, remain for uh, a longer period of time without any uh, stoppage or without any uh, disturbance so this is a kind of uh, question that comes to our mind in in the age of uh, digital humanities and there is a question like what is the act of archiving process and the arc, uh, the act of management so that may be yes, you have five minutes okay so uh, there may be different limitation of the funding issue and all but uh, the moon uh, the main uh, perspective of my uh, work is uh, how to deal with the communities in the archives and new collaborative practice as a framework because as you know that it's based on community based repository where you could find out the engagement of lot of researcher and faculty members of different parts of bengal so i'm not uh, uh, saying all their names because you'll get it in uh, in our repository website Uh, that is called www.cltcsnsu.in so this is the website through which you could uh, you could visit and to, uh, you could know uh, the all the details so for our case what we have done is actually most those who have uh, the pains and suffering who are actually the community here in uh, in bengal partition repository so the main community is are actually those who have this migration um experience maybe their uh, their forefathers maybe their fathers and all they are actually associated with this project and we have facebook page where we'll get uh, so much uh, so much notification uh, the people are those who are people are interested of this project so they are in in contact with us and we could have this interviews so the most another important thing that we are not conducting interviews uh, randomly we are conducting interviews and collects we are collecting uh, stories uh, of those people who are associated with the person of the interview like who is taking the interview so this is actually so for that we have used network actually so this is actually we have used network and our own personal uh, people who are like friends friends and friends uh, friends so these are relatives so these are the ways through which we collect stories and the whole project is well crafted by our project coordinator professor monon kumar mondol with a strong advisory board of writers academician and act activist so here the writers are from two categories one group of writers are those who have published a creative piece on partition like amar mitra and devesh roy both the writers are well known in projecting partition issues in their writings the other groups are academic writers like professor himadri lahiri and so on 
So uh, taking interviews by the person who have already migrated and refugees, as I said. So these advisory board members are always sharing their ideas to make the project well designed and crafted under the leadership of uh, uh, Professor Monon Kumar Mondol. So next to the advisory board, we have two groups of people who are associated with the project, including teacher coordinator, belonging to different colleges and universities and faculty members and other groups of the students and school teachers of different institutes of Bengal who are associated with this project. So there are two categories, as I said. So being a part of an open university, we have both advantages and disadvantages. The first positive advantage is that we have extended study center all around Bengal and thereby you can expand our horizon if you like to. On the other hand, there is a possibility of coordinating with the study center and regional center. So this is uh, the advantage. And I have to, uh, and also uh, <clears throat> there is a disadvantage is the funding crisis. But you know, the, 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 the most challenging situation of funding is, is the funding issue. We are not the university like JNU or SU where there is not a, you will not get the crisis of funding. Where because now we have uh, the specific policies where uh, we'll be talking uh, and there is a categories of universities uh, where you know there is a category of university like A category will get so much fun, B category will get so much fun. So these are the policies through which you know we are lacking behind. But why do we need this community engagement uh, in terms of uh, doing such project? Because this community engagement actually give us uh, with a limitation of, of funding, we could have, we could reach more with the people. And people, those who are associated with this project are more, uh, you know, uh, more uh, uh, emotionally they are engaged with this project because they are somehow, they're talking about their own memories. They're talking something about their own suffering uh, through their, uh, through their story. So as I have, I don't have so much time. So let me conclude. And I'd like to give a reference of Jack Deida where he suggested that archive may not be a concept dealing with the past that might already be at our disposal, but rather the question of the future. So redefined as a question of the future, it is possible to begin exploring how the archive structure, the production of its methodology. So this mythology is actually important for us how to cope up, cope up with the problem of uh, funding crisis. So, uh, you know, there are many uh, community engagement archives where people are associated with this. Uh, people are come up with the solution of these uh, funding related issues. So this is really a serious issue to think what is the future of uh, of a repository and archive in the digital age and how one can uh, keep it alive and what can be done more than this with such limited budget. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you all for uh, giving me uh, an opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Intajali, for uh, the interesting uh, presentation on a project that you have taken up here in the institution, your open university. And uh, Inta Jali's uh, presentation examines, uh, uh, you know, archival kind of uh, information regarding uh, uh, Bengali partition repository. And uh, according to his presentation, but there were many interviews conducted uh, particularly on, uh, you know, lower middle class people in order to explore and uh, the data about uh, you know this uh, uh, about uh, the migration and uh, how uh, this uh, memory got shaped uh, in relation to uh, the partition of Bengal and uh, he could also explore the uh, uh, number of uh, advices and it would be helpful and uh, uh, such as a fic a fiction non-fiction and uh, he also went into websites and. Uh, and other uh, you know, means of uh, uh, the, the sources for communication. And all those things could be part of uh, this uh, archive. So it's, uh, it's a very, very interesting kind of project. And uh, that could be also uh, developed further in the digitized age, what he feels. And, uh, uh, with this, and uh, I would like to and invite uh, Dr. Venela uh, to make our presentation.
on using archival evidence for language research. And after the presentation, I will request Dr. Uh, uh, Vamshi to moderate the pre presentations and uh, to have the interactive section assisting uh, uh, students in the audience. And I invite Vanilla to make a presentation on the opposite topic. Thank you. Thank you, Bhimaya, sir. I'll just begin with sharing my presentation. And before we start also, I would like to talk a little bit about, actually, Intaj's talk has raised a lot of important points. He shared how, can everybody hear me? Yes? Yes, it's fine, fine. Yes, yes, you are audible. Yeah. So I think Intaj's work is very valuable. And those are the kind of archives that I have in mind when I'm talking about uh, archival evidence, collecting archival evidence, and so on. And I have looked around the website also where uh, this Bengal partition archive is quite with the community where the activity reports are um, in the regional language. It's not in English. It's in Bengali, I believe. So it's more e easy for the communities and stakeholders who are involved in that uh, heritage management and revitalizing their own historical origins. That is one point I, I thought is very good in this sort of a repository work. The second thing I also wanted to um, I also wanted to highlight was in the Bengal partition repository work, there is also I think in the terms and conditions, I believe they clearly specify uh, that this is the library fees and this proceed uh, this proceeding or this money is going to go towards maintaining the archive and who are researching into this um, building into this repository. So this uh, this kind of uh, funding model is also for me, it's quite new. And I think it's a desirable situation where funding is a um, definite point where we have access issues to archives, where we don't have sanctions to reach archives to have our daily subsistence, like simple things like boarding, lodging. To cover those, I think this kind of funding model where we have researchers who need materials or agencies who would like to know about communities, those people or that community must be put in touch with people who are maintaining or uh, building an archive. And then those who are actually stakeholders or the um, producers of information. So I think this model is quite new and very desirable for our um, purposes. So that's where I'm going to pick up pick off from in my talk mainly i'm going to take a big step back from uh, the field that uh, intaj has presented to actual basic ideas about what we are going to do with archival evidence we go to an archive luckily we have the funding and then what goes next first let's briefly define what archival evidence is what are the problems while using archival evidence generally and what are a few do's and don'ts when we are undertaking archival analysis? A few past studies, what could have done better, what exactly went wrong, and a small exercise on archival interpretation. Just a retrospective, reflective sort of an exercise towards the end. Um, OK, so this is one question that we all can reflect over. And I'll keep my chat box here open, and we can see the answer, what exactly do you feel is an archive? You can post it on the chat box or you can unmute yourself if that is allowed. Yes. Is it OK if people unmute themselves? It should be OK, Vanilla. Yeah, not a problem. I'll talk fast, ma'am. No, 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 that's OK. They might prefer typing in the chat box. Anything is fine. Just take yeah. a minute and then just think of what an archive is. I have a few textbook definitions. But before we go to that, in, in a very um, 
normal sort of dis, um, discussion terms we can we probably try thinking what an archive is can i attempt yes yes please go on so, <coughs> so for me i think archive is a repository where um, we uh, generally uh, store valuable materials that uh, are that can be endangered in present or might be in future and uh, to uh, and the storage will help uh, for future discussions uh, ex explorations research etc so this is what i in simple terms understand as an archive absolutely so if we have some uh, repositories of information which is quite valuable you want to um, you want to ensure that it is preserved for future generations you are simply that's what an archive is. any other definitions that anybody would like to highlight no repository of vintage items is another definition that's on the chat box now so first one is a simple definition a collection of preserved material that shomik has put in now going towards so we are at an age where a lot of theoretical frames are available for us to understand what an archive is i won't go into discussing each definition but let's briefly read each one and then we'll only discuss the one which is second and third and quickly i'll go to the next slide if the law of it is the law of what can be said and the general system of the formation and transformation of statements this is the famous one from foucault third one is our systems are established archives are systems that establish statements as events and things and involve interstatement intra discursive relations so what exactly does this mean foucault of course has commented on almost anything that is to do with culture uh, socio political fabric of human society so archive is one more aspect where he has commented on what exactly is an archive there are other people also who have highlighted that our history is only made of statements it's text so whatever i know of my origins is on text my birth certificate my certificates and that's what my children my grandchildren and people would know after that so this textuality is something that we must be aware and wary of also and in the second statement i would like all of us to take note of what exactly is that interstatement intra discursiveness i'm sorry my my background is quite animated my sound background so interstatement and intra discursive relations what exactly is the highlighted term indicating it again can we quickly reflect and discuss quickly before going forward interstatement and intra discursive relations because we are going to need it as we go forward in doing a small exercise uh sorry are you asking uh, everyone to elaborate on the specific terms exactly on that specific term only in the in the third definition only on interstatement and intra discursive what does that mean archives are sy systems that establish statements as events and things so you have a statement and when you read the statement i say okay this must have been based on this person and this historical happening and it involves interstatement intra discursive relations what exactly is that interstatement and intra discursive relation uh, i guess it's hinting about uh the existence of alternative discourses that might be present but not uh quote unquote officially documented uh guess there is a there can be general statements but 
there might be different levels of complexities under that general statement which which is um, which is archived in if we say archived in an objective history so the layers of complexities i, I guess these terms actually are highlighting the layers of complexities that might exist in that uh, uh, might exist under the statements of objective history okay so while you are saying it might indicate alternative versions i'm going to go towards saying that a statement and another statement is connected always right it exists in context and due to that context each statement or each historical happening is going to be linked to another one like uh, saumit said i'm so sorry for the noise like saumit said definitely there is going to be an alternative version of it is happening depending on the fabric or the nature of archival evidence you are taking but here i think they are indicating the intra discursive relations where each history is embedded in another historical account so each text is it's another intertext for another historical happening now we'll go over these ideas and discuss and debate as we go forward so as we know i'm not going to dwell on this archival evidence is of course interdisciplinary it cuts across genres could be um any kind of file that you might find for you to use and substantiate a historical account you are trying to construct could be a video file microfiche a good old uh, black and white text anything it represents erases it performs basically a gatekeeping function now let's all going back to that definition slide let's read this text quickly um can anybody except shomik read this aloud no okay i am going to read this aloud then an excerpt from indian muslims by w n lee 1871 if the decision of his lordship in council should be such as i anticipate i shall enter on the performance of my duties with the greatest zeal and alacrity if on the other hand it be the opinion of the government that the present system ought to remain unchanged i beg that i may be permitted to retire from the chair of the committee i feel that i could not be the smallest use here i feel also that i should be lending my countenance to what i firmly believe to be a mere delusion I believe that the present system tends not to accelerate the progress of truth but to delay the natural death of expiring error. I conceive that we have at present no right to the respectable name of a board of public instruction. We are a board of wasting public money for printing books which are of less value than the paper on which they are printed was while it was blank. for giving artificial encouragement to absurd history, absurd metaphysics, absurd physics, absurd theology for raising up a breed of scholars who find their scholarship an encumbrance and a blemish who live on the public while they are receiving their education and whose education is so utterly useless to them that when they have received it they must either starve or live on the public all the rest of their lives entertaining these opinions i am naturally desirous to decline all share in the responsibility of a body which unless it alters its whole mode of processing i must consider not merely as useless but as positively noxious so everybody has read this would you like to go over it just a few more minutes yes no can we move on to the next slide yeah yes yes okay so let's try and uh, answer these two questions just a second it's an office call
so we don't know anything about or- the author we know that he is w n lee to what extent did the interdiscursivity of the text impact our interpretation so this is the text it's can anybody point out what the topic of it is it's clearly education and by this date we know that it is colonial education 1871 the reference clearly shows that so any other interpretation that you can do based on these details how did author positionality impact our interpretation and to what extent did the interdiscursivity of the text that is its placement in a context in a body of knowledge how is that impacting our interpretation yeah as you mentioned that if we haven't if we haven't seen the date or if we haven't read the title of it it would have been we would have assumed it to be relevant to the present society okay i assumed it for a second that it was something that is present and only later i just realized i realized that it it is much more of a historic piece okay i think if you if there is no context that is given to you you usually assume it to be the present context right okay so we wouldn't have been able to place it on a timeline could be 20th yeah. century could be 20th we don't know so the date was useful for that now let's visit the same except again somebody even compared it to macaulay's minutes that's good it's actually from macaulay's minutes now again let's revisit these questions how did the author positionality impact our interpretation and to what extent did the interdiscursivity of the text impact our interpretation because now the citation is more accurate it's an excerpt which is from nicolas minute of 1835 that is reprinted in indian muslims by nasauli william nasauli in 1871 now we have all the facts for interpretation as much as we can glean from the context this is what we know now what exactly is the interpretation we know that it's a contentious author a very quarrelsome has spoken many unpleasant things and it's of course a very famous document this is the interdiscursivity that is quite obviously attached to this aspect or the document the person etc now moving forward this is a small mcq for us what exactly is required for us to carry out research using archival evidence which do you think is the most important a b c or d c i guess see okay anybody any other answers uh i would go with c as well okay anything else anybody else any voting on the chat box okay so we are all on the same page i would also go with c because having a good research question will initially decide what exactly is going to be a theoretical framework it will guide you to your analytical procedures it also can dictate how you are going to draw the data what kind of ethical procedures you are going to follow in gleaning a set of archives now going to the next topic how do you substantiate when you are actually using a set of archival data to build a case to build an account now who can read this aloud now the shape size and rigging of dutch indian men evolved from the late 16th to the 18th centuries in spite of the ship size and specific characteristics 
construction details, particularly in the early 17th century, were poorly recorded or not recorded at all. Their contribution to Dutch wealth and power, however, inspired many artists to paint or draw them. Consequently, the study of Dutch East India men dating to the early 17th century has been based on iconographic evidence, archival records, and contemporary documents on shipbuilding. In fact, a replica of Batavia built in the Netherlands in the 1980s was based entirely on secondary sources. Nevertheless, construction details of Dutch East India men remain largely unknown, although the wreck sites of at least 47 sites of at least 47 East India men have been found and identified. Batavia's wood, wooden hull is the only one dating to the early 17th century from which all hull timbers have been raised and conserved in a way that permits detailed study. All the other known remains from this period have either been salvaged by treasure hunters, looted by fishermen and sports divers, divers or subject to archaeological investigations that included in situ observation or recording only that is not the rising of the hull timbers. This book is a result of five years of study aimed at reconstructing the hull of Batavia as found on the shipwreck site using data retrieved from the archaeological remains. Interpreted in the light of VOC archives, ships journals and Dutch texts on shipbuilding of this period. The foundation for this study, however, was laid by the many archaeologists, conservators and volunteers who have worked with the ship timbers since their excavation in the 1970s. Thank you. So this is mainly about how this particular researcher has based their book that they have written for five years and published. So this is where they are saying my book is about so and so material and this is how I have gathered archival evidence for this, right? So this author is a female author. She is basically saying that this is where I'm getting my information. Archives, ship journals, Dutch texts, and so on. And it is also taking off from other people's research, archaeologists, conservative volunteers. Now she is going to have a difficult job substantiating how without any primary sources, without any samples of an actual ship that is preserved at least in partial shape. She is writing a history of 17th century ships that are constructed by Dutch East India Company. Now, as archival researchers, it is quite difficult for us to avoid a few points when we are not that this author has had a pitfall. Now, what she has done is informed what kind of sources she has used. However, our research is going to be undermined or it, it will help us substantiate our point based on the protocols that we follow. So does anybody like to share anything before I go on? Okay. So do's. Identifying the boundaries and composition of an archive. Intaj also pointed out this very important point. You must understand how an archive is built, what kind of selection goes into building a repository. And we must avoid anachronistic reading. I cannot use or impose definitions which are from the present day to a phenomenon in the past. Right? And observation and documentation of archives without preconceived theoretical standpoints. I cannot go into a research project thinking, okay, now I'm going to use Gramscian analysis to look at so-and-so archives. That may not always work, and it's definitely not a good idea to have a preconceived theoretical standpoint. Then drawing solely from secondary research is also not going to help our case. Again, decontextualized interpretations, where we don't have interdiscursivity or interstatement network. The last one is, of course, obvious, over-literalism and interpretation, and over-interpretation. Now, I'm going to run through to the end. Uh, we can come back to these ideas in the QA. Now, the defending part is difficult because once you finish your MPhil or a PhD project and go out, that is when you'll actually start defending your archival projects. Vanilla, you can continue now. Pardon? Vanilla, you can continue now. 
five minutes or now? Yeah, yeah, I can take five minutes. Five minutes, okay, okay, sir. So that is when we'll actually have to begin uh, um, defending our body of work in by way of publications, by way of research events, etc. Now that is when that MCQ that we did, that small MCQ that we did, where research questions and the centrality of research design is highlighted by all of us. So that is important. And if we can, if we have funding, if we have the luxury to build a small representational corpus of data from various archives, not only from a single archive. With my uh, area of research, if I'm only focusing on South Indian archives, it's going to typify my data. It's not going to have a range of sources. I must be able to travel to other archives where again the aspect of funding comes in. And the last point, but very important point again, patient persistent participation in research dissemination. A prime example is again what Intaj has put up where a very patient participation in building a repository, again, kind of communicating the work, the valuable work that you have done to other stakeholders and so on. Now, this is exactly the opposite case where something was not done right. Let's quickly re read through it. A researcher had very extensive field notes documenting a language that now has no speakers. The researcher has not published for years and did not do language revitalization work, but was still working on the material. The heritage community sought copies of the field notes for its revitalization program. After the researcher passed on to another project, he or she deposited the field notes with other professional papers in a university archive located very far from the heritage community in another state with no special focus on language revitalization. Could, there was the focus on language uh, conservation is lost, shifted. In that case, where, what we are really going to talk about then is how we are going to ensure that our archival projects are useful for somebody. How do we conduct archival research in the context of today, where we have some use for a community in the past or in the future or at present? And what are the data access channels open to stakeholders which, who are involved in the study? We can't take the data, come away, and then not give anything back. So with that kind of um, perspective, what are the challenges of conducting archival research in India in the present context? Um, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to stop here and I'll show you a few challenges that I have shared, but I'm going to let this combine into the QA. Is that okay? Yes? Yes, yes. Uh, Vanilla. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much, Intaz and Vanilla. Uh, we really started with a right note <laughs> talking about archives that two, two people, you know. Uh, Working at the same archives, but you know, at a different level altogether. Inta started talking about how to collect, what are the strategies, what are the methodologies to collect the the, the archival material and you know uh, and process it. And Vanilla is talking about you know uh, after processing, how do we interpret it? How do we look at the the, the kind of material? What do we do it and how how do we go ahead? Uh, so interesting, you know, in a sense uh, we uh, you know uh, with the emergence of digital humanities at this moment. Everybody is talking about data, and uh, people. I mean, it 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 becomes a little difficult for people who are uh, doing qualitative analysis. You know, qualitative analysis has become you know very redundant and a very old model. Now everybody is talking about you know where is the data, how do you show, where is the evidence, you know that kind of stuff. There, it's become very really you know trending and booming this. And in that you know background, uh, archival research is absolutely you know uh, amazing and fascinating. People are doing a lot of people, a lot of Japanese universities, Chinese universities are doing the archival data. A lot of uh, universities are funding, not so much in India, of course, as in does uh, rightly pointed out the kind of you know hurdles to get funding and all. Uh, but you know this is a very uh, happening uh, research field, and we are really happy. And uh, thank you, Tagir, uh, to initiate you know with our own Almane. Uh, so I uh, with, the, with this brief uh, you know. Uh, uh, Intervention. I would like to you know request others, the participants, to kind of get pitch in your own ideas, uh, either through chat chat box, and if you have any internet issues, otherwise please uh, uh, please uh, uh, share your uh, comments, 
concerns, suggestions, or any questions? Hi, Vendela. So in the don'ts, you, you were talking about not to use the secondary sources, right? OK, some if the archival evidence is dates long back into the history, but when the primary source is not available, and there are lots of references about the primary sources in other texts or other paintings or even in it, in any other way there are references of the primary text what do you, how, how do you go about validating if the primary text ever existed okay so our, if our project is about uh, let me go back to what i said i said that solely relying on secondary sources is a strict don't right in such cases where you don't have any primary material at all like the case that we saw where uh, the author is trying to reconstruct how shipbuilding was there with no samples at all she had absolutely no primary material but what she had in her defense done is gathered a lot of sources and not only secondary sources some bit of primary sources which are paintings just as you said a painting is a valuable archive right it's a record where people must have put in a lot of detail the same detail is lost if they are reproducing the primary material in text or in a painting right so i think if you have access to paintings that's another primary source is what i feel the terms themselves primary secondary tertiary sources yes it has collapsed but relying only on secondary research is what i feel we must be wary of did, did i answer that question no, no, no. Yeah, I, we must be wary. That's what. How to be wary about it? That's the question. I'm <laughs> very, like, very what, what should we consider this right and what's not? Like, how, how to go about it? We, we definitely will have to push all we can towards primary sources. No other way, actually. Talk to people, try to find out as much as we can. If we still can't find enough information, we need to say that we please ebb an account based on only secondary sources and secondary okay. but that will be a review of literature right so yeah yeah i will research project yeah yeah got it it does you want to uh, address some uh, question that has been put out in the chat box when you are uh, kind of speaking about the uh, no uh, yeah uh, yeah yeah uh, there is one question that came up by umar yes uh, the question Umar raised is the archive does not exist apart from Bhadralok Academia worldwide. How does uh, the archive of Bengal partition BPR, BPR uh, broad based as it is, function as a site of thinking as well in terms of integration and also Mediterranean communalism? Okay, so as I understood for this question, I, I must say that if you look at uh, our university, like our project work in this, uh, in case of, as I said, like I have not got so much time in uh, putting forward on specific on, on the community issues actually. So actually, if you look at the interviews, it is actually mostly uh, based on not in uh, uh, or done on Bhadalo communities. It's actually the people are, as I said, are lower class people, like lower middle class people and those who have suffered. Even if we look at the specific zone of our interviews are not only uh, 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 not done uh, in around Kolkata, it's more on district level. So if you look at the representation of our project and also, uh, you know, uh, we have not, uh, and even the project is uh, done by a people, a group of people or community who has uh, the personal experience of this loss and suffering of migration. So, and also uh, people have not been done so much, like there are 30 universities, uh, maybe more than uh, 30 universities in Bengal. And in Bangladesh, maybe there are more universities but nobody has done certain kind of things like in case of repository, even for the access point of view. In India, I have not seen so much uh, archive or repository will give you 
a direct access to their material. But we are giving, we are giving access to all the people. So there are very less, like there are very hardly you'll find any kind of, uh, you know, universities who gave you access worldwide. We are giving it. So in case of representation, in case of our selection uh, of interviews, and in case of the project management, I think that it's not kind of uh, the question that you raise about elitism or maybe um, the project done by certain kind of academia. It's not like that for in our case. Even we have more focus on the vernacular language, not English as a, as you say, no, South Asian perspective or whatever. But our focus is on regional language because we wanted to uh, show this uh, you know, material to the people who are, uh, who, who has suffered, who has this pain and suffering. So as we say, no, uh, mostly we'll, uh, we say that archiving is not you know, important if you don't go back to the community. So we are not focused on only English language. We are more, more focused is on vernacular, especially in Bengali language, so that people can understand, people can reach it out, people can see it, their own work. So that is actually, uh, I could say, to conclude of your uh, question that it's actually our representation and the project man management and the access point through which we, uh, we, we want to make it for people's project. Even now we have a tagline of this uh, project name is people's project. So it is not only the university project, it's a project of the people. It's not only you know one people, it's a group of people's work. So that's why we named it as people's project. So through it, you'll understand this is not my or yours. It is for everyone. And there lies the importance of access point. I hope I have answered your question. Thank you. Uh, hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. So uh, first of all, first of all, thank you both for your wonderful presentations. Um, my question, although uh, not a question actually, but a request for elaboration to both of the speakers is, um, what are the ethical issues of archiving? Uh, if both of you can just reflect on that a bit. Thank you. I am, for me, ethical issues when I was working on, so my research area is simply colonial archives and how bilingual textbook making worked. And I'm equally interested in the past and the present. I'm interested in writing bilingual textbooks, that is English and uh -huh. right now. And I've tried to see how the textbook design was working in, because I'm a part of, uh, the ELT, ELS areas of research. I'm interested mainly in that. And in that, the ethical issues are simply whether to um, whether to copy a book completely when a library is asking you not to. I was not really working with human subjects. So at, in this current project, of course, data confidentiality is quite different where I was working with children and um, teachers where I can't show their faces in a particular um, research dissemination event. I'm not going to talk about that work. I'm only going to talk about using archives. In some places, there are files which are more than 100 years old. And you specifically know that um, this material has been stolen from India and taken to another country. And you are in another country referring to them after so much of travel, so much of painstaking hurdles on your side. So then that shouldn't really impact. So apart from that, I have not had ethical procedures in working with archival material. It's all printed text material only. OK. Is it done for you, Vanilla? Yeah, for, yeah, my, yeah, case, uh, for yes. my case, I, I would say, already I have said it, but again, I'm trying to say it, that this ethical issue uh, depends on uh, on uh, information and knowledge sharing, not keeping with you the data or the information with you only. As an archivist or as a repository uh, maker, you need to uh, give access to the people. This is one of the things that access point should be given. The second thing is those who are taking interviews, the people from where you are taking interviews, you're supposed to give them a copy of it. And I have heard this one from Amlandas Gupta, Professor Amlandas Gupta from Jadupur University, 
when I have attended some of uh, his workshop. So where he said that, see, in the, this is not the fact that you put off things or take some things from some people, but you're supposed to return to that person a copy of it, either it's a digital copy or a hard copy, whatever copy uh, that is with you. So that is also the ethical issues that you are taking something but this is maybe not your material, but you're supposed to give them back to them also as a find out, like as a copy of it so that they also understand like what is going to uh, deal with and what is there in their archive. The third thing is there are certain issues, for example, <clears throat> uh, in, in, in particular to like archive is not only a kind of one type of archive. There are so many types of archives there. But in case of Bengal Partition Repository, I would say that there are certain issues, like now we have a citizenship issue, right? So in citizenship issue, there is a problem of giving a uh, whole interview uh, into like in YouTube or maybe in, uh, in, uh, in any public sphere. So in public sphere, maybe you're not able to give hold the interviews, but because there are sensitive issues, they may be when they're uh, giving the interviews, they may not be aware of sharing something, but that sensitive issue, you need to take care of it. So that sensitive issue should not be publicly, you know, uh, put off uh, so that uh, there is some kind of problem happens to that family or maybe that person. So that things we need to keep in mind whenever we are sharing their interviews. So that is also an ethical responsibility. The fourth one, uh, ethical responsibility is those who are working as a community uh, project associate or teacher, we are not uh, concentrating that you're not able to publish it anywhere. We are trying to say them that, that you can publish the work by acknowledging the repository and you can have an article of your own. So we have done this even there are people who are research associated like Pratim Dash or some uh, other research uh, associate fellow they are writing papers uh, either in Bengali or English and they're publishing it with us only or maybe somewhere else also by acknowledging uh, the work. So this is also ethical issue that you, you are not uh, fixing the things that you're not able to publish it anywhere. So those who are associated with this, they have that opportunity to publish uh, the work that I have conducted during this project. So this is also a kind of ethical issue I think uh, uh, is whenever we're doing a project. So this is uh, what I have said in terms of Bengal Partition Repository project. Maybe there are other ethical issues that we can think of. Like for example, ethical issues in terms of those who are viewers, they have their ethical issues. You're supposed to mention it like as a bibliography or reference point of time when you watch it in our repository or website. So I think these are the uh, common uh, ethical issues that we uh, face during uh, doing the project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, in Taj, I just have a small you know, uh, uh, doubt, you know, when you are talking about uh, uh, making a huge repository of such as, you know, BPR, uh, who would uh, uh, would have the copyrights over the material? Because you would be uh, that the project involves a lot of human subjects, a lot of you know materials that you uh, you gather, and then you put it. You know, you, there's a lot of effort in that, and a lot of money that is involved, a lot of resources that you use. So once you uh, put it in one place, good that you are uh, making it you know uh, free or sometimes you know little uh, chargeable. But who will have the copyright over that? Uh, because that that becomes an issue. Somebody was talking about. Who will have the authority over the material and who would control the material at the end of the day? See, copyright issue always with our center. Like this is very normal thing because, uh, and uh, when you're talking about lot, it's not a lot of a funding. It's very, you know, if I say the what is the, uh, how much fund we have got for this, you will laugh at it. So it's very less fun. And it's uh, like with this less, nobody can imagine that certain work can be done with this limited budget. Uh, so I think uh, we, uh, as a center, we hold this copyright, but we are not saying that you're not able to do anything. You can acknowledge us and you can uh, talk to us and you can do uh, whatever research you want to conduct. There is no certain things that you cannot do. 
but copyright is always with the center and with the project director's permission. Okay. And because, is, because the center is involved with that, right? So yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. Anyone else has any? Yeah, any questions for Vanilla and Itas? Yeah, I, I have one more doubt regarding the archiving. And now, because we have so much of social media and print media, so in one or the other way, whatever that's happening around somewhere in any corner of the society will be written down by in one, one or the other place, either it be the newspaper or a blog or a website or even a tweet. Okay. So what are the issues you face while archiving something which was prior to these ages in the sense when print media was not that, that much of a big thing, which is, which can cover a lot of ground of the society. So what are the other things you look at? for the representation of this oral narratives that are happening all around the society. Imagine a quarrel has happened. It hasn't been documented. Now there are newspapers to document it, everything. If, imagine it, if, if it had happened somewhere in, 19, in, the beginning of, in the beginning of 1900s or something. Like, so what are the sources we will look at to, doc, to see something regarding that? Should I say? Yeah, I think it's a gen yeah, very general I'm question, not uh, related to the kind of work, but you can always comment, yeah, please. Uh, for that, you know, uh, I think there lies the importance of what to select and what not to select, right? Because everything is is not uh, that, uh, that everything is not archivable, like everything will not document. So uh, our aim, main aim is to collect memories. Uh, and uh, certain things like photographs or maybe letters that is not publicly published. And as I said in the beginning also, that our focus aim is not on the mainstream media. So what is not in the mainstream media and what is not uh, available uh, in the archive, that is actually the primary concern of uh, of uh, Bengal partition project. So this is, uh, here lies the importance, as I said, like what to select and what not to select. So when you are involved with this project, certain kind of project, you will have the idea which to skip and which to include. Yeah, got it. Can I add to that? Do we have time? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. So, yeah. and to answer Nikhil's question, that brought to my mind one quarrel which which went on a big scale, the anti-Hindi protests in 1937. They are not very well documented. They are referred to in accounts which deal with language loyalty, emotions of South Indians attached to language, etc. But a full-scale historical project on anti-Hindi agitation is still it's lacking. Um, I don't know why, but this kind of project would probably depend on how uh, black flag demonstrations were undertaken, how were the past happening, what was the censorship in the print media. There are so many sources that you can use to reconstruct what went down during that time. As it could be like Intash said, selection of sources really depends on what the research question is. What would you like to find out? What was the censorship or how was the police brutality working out or who were the uh, national leaders who were holding camps? The, which kind of research question exactly are you going to focus on in your research project? I think that will kind of guide you to what kind of material you would like to collect and where you can kind of draw around a scope and say, okay, this is all the material I'm going to use. Yeah. Thank you. Vanilla. Thank you. Vijay. Uh, if uh, that is it, then uh, I request the uh, uh, Suman, I guess, uh, to give a word of thanks. I again, once again, thank you, uh, Intaz and Vanilla. Very good to see you. Hopefully, we'll see you again, uh, you know, in the physical seminars, not just virtual. Yeah, so we will catch up with many alumni. You know, please keep, keep joining the meets. And once this Corona thing is gone, probably we can all 
meet up once again and do uh, some uh, activity. So, yeah. uh, shall we request uh, Subhan to give a word of thanks? Uh, thanks for the yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, mention my thanks, Intas and Vendala. It's Thank very, you. very nice to have you with us. I, uh, As Vamshi said, I really hope there'll be a day very soon where we'll all meet and uh, exchange not only ideas, but also pleasantries. Thank you yes. so much for joining us. Thank you, ma'am. We are waiting for that moment. Yes, yes Intas. Yes, Suman, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. It's been an engaging lecture. I would like to present the vote of thanks. We take this opportunity to thank our chief guest, Mohammad Imtia Jali, for sparing us his precious time to talk about his research in finding gaps in Bengal partition repository in CLTCS. My heartfelt thanks to Dr. R. Vanilla. It was a very useful and interactive presentation. I would like to thank Dimaya sir for chairing this event and Bamshi sir for moderating. Thank you, Shomik, for the welcoming speech. Thank you, Tahir, Ansari sir, and Soumya ma'am for coordinating the lecture series. And finally, I would like to thank all of you for participating in today's event. Thank you. <laughs>